give you thanks and glory. In Jesus' name. Can we shout a big A? Please join me as we welcome Dr. James Fallight. Give him a big up. I want to thank Pastor Sarah for the opportunity of sharing with these women the incredible potential that God has to change Nigeria and the world that's right here in this building this morning. I want to thank Pastor David for sharing for that message, for what uh, God has spoken to him about identity. That is so important. Uh, this morning, I was in Isaiah chapter 26, just in my reading through the Bible this year. And it, it simply says this in verse 3. You will keep him, or you will keep her, in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you, because she trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever. For in Yah, in Yahweh, the Lord is everlasting strength. That is our identity. It's not any of the other things. It's our identity. Thank you, Pastor David. Yesterday in the men's meeting, I mentioned that um, as you travel through life, as you travel around different places, you meet a lot of people. Uh, you meet a lot of people, you have a good time with them, you connect with them for a short time, and then you go on with your life, and uh, sometimes occasionally you might remember, but most of the times uh, you go on with your life because you're meeting thousands of people. But occasionally, you meet someone and your paths cross, and then their presence actually leaves footprints in your heart. There's an indelible impression that they make on your heart. And because of that, you sense a connection with them from then on. And that's what I've felt with Pastor David. That we have kindred spirits. We are passionate about the same things. And so uh, this is my brother. I feel a very strong kindred spirit to my brother, Pastor David. You are so fortunate that God has given you such a man of God that has such, such a vision for what God can do through all of you for His name's sake and for His glory. I actually mentioned to him as he sat down, I said, basically, I'm going to continue the message. Uh, it's, it's a similar thing. God has been dealing in, in my own heart a very similar thing than what he has already shared. And uh, so I was just thinking about the Olympic Games that have just finished. Uh, the Olympic Games in Brazil and in uh, the track and field competition they have what is known as the relay races and, and a person will run for maybe 100 meters or 200 meters and then they will pass the baton and then it's the same race but different runners uh, so I'm going to pretend that this microphone is the baton so I'm going to take the baton from my brother and now I'm going to try to run my leg of the race and we'll have the Holy Spirit to help us to the finish line. I want to share with you from the Word of God from Colossians chapter 3. This is not a presentation. This is just simply a word from God. These actually are my life verses. A number of years ago, God impressed the truth of these verses so deeply on my heart that I, I've just said, these are the verses that I consider my life verses. They are so fundamental to what it means to be a Christian. And if we can get this part, the kernel of truth, deep in our heart, then we will continue on until we meet Jesus. The interesting thing about Colossians, it's written by the Apostle Paul, as many of the books in the New Testament are. The Apostle Paul, in most cases, had founded a church, and so he's writing back to the church that he had founded, like Philippi, the Philippians, or 
Thessalonica, the Thessalonian letters, or Ephesus, the Ephesian letter. Those are churches that he founded. Or in other cases, it's people that were a part of his team or very close, close colleagues, for example, in the letters to Timothy, or the letter to Titus, or the letter to Philemon. Those were to people that were colleagues of his, and he was writing to encourage them. And there's some abundant truth that we can have in all of those letters. However, there are two letters that were written to churches that he had not founded. In fact, he had not been there. He had never been to Rome, not yet. He would eventually make it to Rome. But when he's writing the Romans, he had not yet been there. He had heard that there was a church that had been planted in Rome, so he's writing a letter. And that's true also of this letter, the letter to the Colossians, to the city of Colossae. He did not found that church. Someone else did. We don't know who did. But he had heard about them, and so he is writing a letter to them. Now, I think that in both of these cases... The Apostle Paul, since he had not founded the church, he wanted to make sure that they understood what it meant to be a Christian. It is filled with doctrinal and theological truth. The book of Romans is so deep in its theological truth because he wanted to make sure that they understood. And even though the book of Colossians is shorter than the book of Romans, those deep theological truths are still there. And so we want to look at one simple truth that the Apostle Paul shares in Colossians chapter 3. We'll be reading in verses 1 through 4, Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 1, where it says this, If ye then be risen with Christ, Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So when Christ, who is our life, appears... Then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Now I think what the Apostle Paul was trying to get across is one simple truth. One simple truth. And if we can get this one truth deep in our heart, it will guide us, it will direct us, it will challenge us all of the days of our life. Now here is that truth. One simple truth. There are two worlds. There are two distinct realities. Okay, first of all, there is this current world. Um, we see its sights. We hear its sounds. We feel its matter. It is the world that we are now living in. Now if some of you are having challenges believing that this world is real, you need to talk to somebody. It's real. This is a real world and we are existing in a real world. However, here's what the Apostle Paul is trying to get across. There is another world. It is just a... No... It's more real than this one. Because this world has been cursed by sin. That world has not been cursed by sin. This world will pass away. That world is eternal. The Bible says that only those who accept it by faith will ever see it and ever realize it. And the Bible calls that heaven. There are two worlds. There is this world. There is another time and another place. And this is where the baton will be passed on. The kicker is this. You can only place your identity in one of them. 
You cannot choose both. Wow. You have to place your identity in one. The Bible talks about that identity, Brother David, and he give, and they give it a name. It's called citizenship. Citizenship. Abraham looked for a city whose builder and maker was God. He looked beyond this current world. He looked to another time and another place. We look in Hebrews chapter 11 and we see the hall of fame of those men and women of faith and they were looking beyond. Moses chose affliction rather than the pleasures of sin for a season. He looked beyond this current world situation and he chose another time and another place. Now, once you decide that, and by the way, virtually all of you who are here, except maybe the very small, small children, all of you who are here have already made a choice. Your identity is either in this world or it's in another time and another place. Now once you have placed your identity somewhere, it will determine a lot of things in your life. Once you've decided to place your identity in this world or in another time and another place, it will determine, number one, it will determine what you consider to be valuable. Okay? Verse 1 says, if... Now, honestly, okay, when you're reading through the Bible, are there sometimes when you're reading and you come to a spot and you kind of just scratch your head and you know, what does that mean? Okay, this is one that could be like that because it says this in verse 1, if ye then be risen... Or other versions will say it this way, since you have been raised. Now verse 2, I mean, excuse me, verse 3, the beginning of verse 3 says, for you are dead. Now, that can cause you to scratch your head a little bit. I mean, some of you look a little sleepy this morning. But I'm still breathing. My heart... Let me, let me check that. My heart's still beating. There's brain waves going across. How can I be dead? What does it mean if ye then be risen? It's talking about dying. It's talking about being raised. Now if he was talking about the resurrection at the end of time when we're raised from the dead and we meet Jesus, that would be one thing. But he says if ye then be risen. In other words, you are already raised. And you're already died. So what does that mean? I think the Apostle Paul clarifies that in the Corinthian letter. And by the way, for those who perform baptism, the Corinthian letter, the teaching in the Corinthian letter is a really good thing because it says, and you can help me with this, if any man or any one woman be in Christ, they are what? A new creation. All things are? Behold, all things are? I become new. All right, here's what we do in baptism. All right? It says, old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's why we baptize people. Not only talk about the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but the truth is, there is our own death. Our own burial. We are buried with Him in baptism. And we rise to walk in newness of life so what it means for those of us who are Christian and what the Apostle Paul was trying to get across to them is when you become a Christian all things pass away behold all things become new and what that means is you value different things now let's start for just a moment I wish we had time for us to dialogue here and for you to answer some of these questions because I think it would be fascinating what does this world value? This world. Well, we could list a lot of things. I'll list a few. Money. 
money, power, position, authority, beauty. This world values that. Oh my. There's billions, billions, billions of dollars in Naira that are spent on beauty because this world values beauty. This world values athletic ability. We will pay billions of Naira for a football player who has athletic ability. What can he do? He can run real fast and he can kick a ball. He can run real fast, he can kick a ball, and we will give him billions of naira for doing that. This world values athletic ability. This world values sexual experiences. This world values a lot of different things. Now here's the thing. Pretty much all of those things in and of themselves are not evil, they're not bad. But when we give them the highest value, that's when it becomes dangerous in our life. We start giving value to things that are not what the same things that heaven values. For example, beauty. Pastor, Pastor David has talked about this for a while. My mother was the only woman in our house. There was my dad, there was my brother, me and my mom. Just two boys and my mother. So my mother, early on in life, decided it was her job to teach her sons about women. And so whenever we started having interest in the girls, I remember my mother giving a little proverb. Now sometimes proverbs don't necessarily translate, but I think this one will. This was a proverb my mother gave us from where she grew up when she was a little girl. And it, it goes like this. Beauty is only skin deep. But ugly is to the bone. <laughs> Once beauty falls off, ugly hangs on. And what she was saying to us is, James, my brother John, when you are looking at a young lady and you're potentially thinking about spending your life, make sure you look beyond the physical. Make sure you look beyond the clay. Because you're going to need to live with this person for the rest of your life. And there needs to be some real spiritual qualities and depth of soul. And praise God, God gave me both. Gave me a very beautiful woman on the outside and also a tremendously powerful and beautiful woman on the inside. And as I said yesterday, the truth is that she had the major part of raising our children. I was gone a lot. I tried to fulfill my responsibility, but she did most of that. And all three of our kids love God. They serve God. They're raising their families to love God and serve God. And the truth is, if I had only married for beauty, I could have never had the ministry that I have now. So the thing is, those are the things that this world values. What does the other world value? What does the other world value? The other world values godliness, honesty, integrity, a soul one to Jesus Christ. In other words, the Bible says that one soul is worth more than all of the world because this world will pass away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abides forever. So listen. Listen very carefully. Wherever you've decided to place your identity, your citizenship, either it's in this world or it's in another time and another place, it will determine what you consider to be valuable. Secondly, it will determine how you spend your life. Now this is a very important truth. Please underline this in your notes or in your mind. Whatever you consider to be valuable, 
Whatever you consider to be valuable, that's what you will spend your life chasing after. Whatever it is that you consider to be valuable, you'll chase after it. Now here's what will happen. If you consider money to be of most value, if that's the most important value to you, you know what you will do? You will lie for money. You will cheat for money. You will not tell people the truth. You will try to hedge things. You will steal from people. You will do whatever you can so that you can get money. If power is most important to you, you will not be ethical. You will use corruption. You will do all sorts of things so that you can get into a position of power. That's what you will do because that's of the utmost value to you. If sex is the utmost value to certain people and all across the world now, there are people who are sacrificing their health they're sacrificing their reputation. They're sacrificing everything. They're putting their own families at risk because they're chasing after something they think is valuable to them. Now, whatever you consider to be valuable, make sure because what your heart, out of the abundance of the heart, is where our whole values will come from. So make sure to, to choose which values you value the most. Now, let's say that you value the things of heaven. I promise you, if you value the things of heaven, of godliness and honesty and integrity, a soul one to Jesus Christ, a people group who's never heard the gospel will hear the gospel because you have a passion for people who've never heard. If those are the things you value most, you will spend your life chasing after them. Chasing after them. What will that look like? I have a dear friend in the state of Arkansas in the United States. His name is Cameron. His wife is Krista. God has blessed Cameron. He's a businessman. He owns several businesses. He would be considered a wealthy man. But Cameron and his wife Krista have different values. Now God has blessed them with money. But here are their values. I've spent the night in their home on several occasions. I've been around with their children as they spend time in the Word of God every night. As they're praying for missionaries. They can name their children, even when their children were small, could name all 65 countries in the world where Christians are persecuted. And they would pray for them. They would know countries like Kyrgyzstan, in Uzbekistan, in Tajikistan. They would know them as little children. As you walk to the hall, to the bedroom of their four children, there is a map of the world. It goes from the floor and it goes to the ceiling. It's several meters long. It's a map of the world. And on that world, there are pictures of missionaries who are serving different places around the world. And they want their children to know as they walk to their bedroom that there are people around the world who are trying to reach unreached people. Cameron went with me on a trip to India, up in northeast India. The poorest area, one of the poorest states in India is a state called Bihar and West Bengal, the state just to the east of it. And Cameron went with me on this trip. We went to a village, Samanpurhat. No one knows where that village is. It's an it's indescript village. And we were in this village and we were the, with a missionary who was reaching 11 different people groups who were, who were there. And Cameron called his wife back in the U.S. on the telephone. And I was listening to him as he was talking with her. And he said this. He said, Krista, I think I found it. And after he hung up, I said, Cameron, what are you talking about? He said, Krista and I have been praying for somewhere we, where we could take our family, all four of our ch children. And their children were five and six 
and 10 and 11 at those times. So they weren't large children. But they took their children who were still in, in primary school. And they said, we want to take them somewhere for several months. We want to live somewhere so that our children, as they grow up, realize that there are people who do not know Jesus and they don't have an opportunity to hear. And we want them to realize that as they grow up. And so Cameron and Krista took all four of their children and they moved to Northeast India for four months. He turned his businesses over to other people to run them while he was gone. And he gave, gave all of his attention so his children would know what's valuable. God had blessed him financially, but he wanted his children to know this family does not place money as our top priority. This money does not pay position and power. He had both of those. That's not our top priority. The, the top priority, the thing that this, that this family values is honesty and godliness and integrity and a soul unto Jesus Christ and those peoples of Northeast India. Those people that they would hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now let me just tell you this. Whatever you value, you will spend your life Chasing after that. And by the way, if you want to know what you value, I can give you three tests. Three tests that can determine what you value. Uh, number one, we all have to pay bills. We have to pay rent or we have to pay our utility bills. We have to pay all sorts. We have to eat. We have to do. But when you have discretionary money, what do you spend your money on? That's what you value. Number two, what do you spend your time on? I know you have to either go to school during the day or maybe you have to go to work during the day. But after you've done that, what do you spend your time on? And for those of us who are parents or grandparents, what do you push your children towards? What do you push your children towards? I want the best for my three children. All of us who are parents, we want the absolute best for our children. And you can tell what parents value by what they push their children towards. I was preaching one time at a conference in the state of Illinois. The choir, there was a choir that was sitting behind me. And I was preaching, it wasn't this message, but it was similar to this message, with the thought of what we do and what we pass on to our kids. And there was someone who was weeping, crying. It was a man. He was crying. He audibly was crying as I was speaking. And I did not want to turn around and look. So I just kept on speaking. I kept on preaching. And I talked about that we pass our values on to our children. It came time at the end of the message that the man came and he knelt at the altar and he was just weeping. He was weeping. And the pastor came and the pastor dealt with him. And after the service, I, I asked the pastor, I said, what was, what was that man's problem? And he said, he had four sons. And all four sons, he had spent all of the time helping them, coaching them, spending time with them playing baseball. He had coached them so that they could be outstanding baseball players. All four of them, the last one was getting a college scholarship to university to play baseball. But none of the four sons were in church at all. He had spent his life pushing baseball into the life of his sons, but he had not spent the time pushing the things that heaven values into his son. Whatever you decide is your ultimate values, you'll spend your life chasing after that, and that's what you will pass on to your children. By the way, we only have one life. We only have one life. And so we have to invest it in something. Make sure you're investing it in what eternity values. Now the third point is a really precious one. And God will bless you if you'll allow Him. Number three. Wherever you decide to place your identity, first of all, it will determine what you consider to be valuable. Secondly, it will determine how you spend your life. Thirdly, it will determine in difficult times 
where you draw your power. Because verse 3 says, For ye died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Okay? Your life, your real life, this is not my real life. This is not my real life. My real life is in heaven eternally with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That's my real life. And it says here that you died and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. Now, let me promise you this. After having lived a number of years on this earth and gone through a lot of different uh, situations, every single one of us, at some point in time, the bottom will fall out. Everything will collapse. And you will face a crisis. It may be a crisis when the economy falls or you lose a job. It may be when there's a health crisis. Or it may be when a family member dies. My wife, her, both her mother and her father, we have been with them as they died. There's going to come a time, honestly, that everything, if you spend your life chasing after money, what's going to happen when the economy falls or you get laid off from a job and you don't have that? You're going to be desperate because you have placed your identity in money and it's not there. What's going to happen in power and position when people realize that you've been lying and cheating and stealing to get the position that you have and you're sacked? Then there's nothing. That's why some people commit suicide. When everything falls apart, they have nothing left, they have nothing to bank on, and they've given their life over to these things and there's nothing. I promise you this, if you place your values in this world, if you chase after the things of this world, there will come a time where that will not satisfy at all and you're going to be standing empty. But here's the thing. If you have placed your identity in another time and another place. If your citizenship is in heaven, then none of that can touch your real life. Losing a job, that can't touch your real life. When the doctor says that you've had a heart attack or there's cancer, that cannot touch your real life. Your real life is hidden with Christ and God. Nothing can touch your real life because that is in another time and another place. So wherever you place your identity, it will determine what you value, how you spend your life. Thirdly, where you draw power in difficult times. And finally, wherever you've decided to place your identity, it will determine at the end of your life whether your life was a success or a failure. Verse 4 says, When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with Him in glory. I do not know how I will die. Neither do you. Have you ever made bargains with God about how you would die? Oh God, I don't want to die this way. We all have ways we don't want to die. Honestly, Pastor David, I, I quit making bargains with God about how I'll die. I really don't care anymore. I, I, I don't care. Um, I may not make it home. I don't know. I cannot guarantee that I will make it back to my family. I don't know. But, <clears throat> if it comes to the point in my life where the doctors and the family and everyone knows that I'm dying. So we have some advanced notice. He's, he's dying. He's just old. He's dying. There's really only two things that I want at that point when I come to the point of death. There's only two things that I want. If my wife Anita is still living, I would like for her to be there. She's been with me on all of the journey. And I'd like for her to be there. And I'd like for her to hold my hand. If my children are still living, my son Daniel, 
his wife Michelle, their three children, Elise and Justice and Naomi, I'd like for them to be there. My daughter Rachel, her husband Chris, their two children, Lillian and Andrew, I'd like for them to be there. My daughter Rebecca, she's not married yet, but she's very close. I'd like for her to be there. And if she is married, I'd like for her husband to be there. And if God blesses their home with children, I'd like for them to be there. I'd like for them all to be there, and I'd like for them to gather around my bed. And I would like for them to say with honesty and integrity, I would like for them to be able to say to me, Dad, Grandpa, you led us well. You taught us the truth. We love you. And we will see you in the morning. And as my hand loosens its grip on Anita's hand, I want to hold a nail-scarred hand. And I definitely want him to say, I definitely want him to say, Well done. But, but our Father is not a liar. And He will not say well done if we have not done well. And so therefore, I want to give all of my life, all of my life, because one day, just as sure as I'm standing here, I will draw my last breath. And I want to have given every ounce of energy I possibly can, all of the way, knowing that I fail many times. And Pastor David is correct. It's not on performance. It's on the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. But in the midst of all of that grace, I want to work for Him as much as I possibly can. Realizing that's not my identity, but I do want to do everything I can. I want to place my identity not here, but there. And I want to spend my life chasing after that. When I was a teenager, there was, um, there was a song we sang. I, I don't hear it anymore, not even in the U.S. much. But it spoke to my heart as a young person to really about these matters of we only have one life. And, um, and in fact, that's the name of the song. But um, it, it goes something like this. And I'll just sing it a cappella. But maybe I can remember enough of it that it might be a blessing to you. But it says, It matters so little How much you may own the places you've been or the people you've known for it all comes to nothing I'll just do it acapella for it all comes to nothing when placed at his feet it's nothing to Jesus, just memories to keep. Only one life, so soon it will pass. Only what's done for Christ will last. And only one chance to do His will. So give to Jesus all your days. It's the only life that pays when you recall you have but one life. God has gifted every single one of you. You are precious in His sight. He has done that by His grace. And all He wants 
Don't chase, chase after the things this world values. Don't spend your life worrying about those things. As Pastor David said, it's not the clay. It's the inner beauty. It's the inner woman that God has created you to be. And chase after those things with all of your life. And I promise you, when we meet in heaven, we may never meet again here, but when we meet in heaven, we will all be able to say, it was worth it all. Yes. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank You for Dominion City. I thank You for these dear men and women, especially, Lord, these women who have gathered. Lord, they are precious. They are the apple of Your eye. Lord, the incredible potential that resides here. If they will not spend their life chasing after the values of this world, Lord, they simply will set their affection on things above, not on things of the earth. And as a result, they will go into neighborhoods. They will lead their safety. They will lead their security, trusting in You. Lord, they will march forth under the bloodstained banner of Jesus Christ. They will go forth with courage and they will do mighty exploits. Lord, even as Jesus Christ said, greater works than these they will do. And so, Father, as they set your, their affection on things above, oh, Father, I pray that you would use them in a mighty way. Lord, that you would pour upon them the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that you would bless them as they rise up. I pray that you would bless them as they go out. I pray that you would bless them as they come back in. I pray that you would bless them as they lie down. I pray that you would bless the work of their hands and use them for your namesake and your honor and your glory. And we pray all of this in the strong and mighty name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.